So in the last video, we talked about the process of development of the scientific name uh, from early taxonomy to what we actually do, do today. And we talked about how the scientific names solve the confusion and ambiguity and standardize the naming mechanism and also provides insight and relationship between animals. So we are going to take this for further and talk about the other advancements that Linnaeus actually did in the classification of, of animals. And that's actually in the beginning of the history of biology, the Linnaean taxonomy was actually the breeding ground for naturalists to meet and uh, talk about this, the Linnaean Taxonomy Society. And he actually was the one that came up with this classification that we use today. Now, he actually never used domains. This is a, a modern uh, thing. Uh, but he did establish the whole species, genus, family, order, class, phylum, kingdom. Or if you want to remember in an easy way, I remember like this. Uh, dirty king Philip came over for a great shower. You know, because he needed one because he was dirty. All right. So anyways, domain is the, it, ha, it refers to the type of life that you are mostly in terms of your ribosomal RNA. And we'll talk more about this later in the lecture series. And you have three domains. You have the eukarya domain, the eubacteria domain, and the archaea domain. Now, within the eukarya domain, which includes all the types of cells which have internal uh, organelles or membranes, you have the animalia kingdom, for example, and you also have the fungi kingdom, you also have the protista kingdom, and you also have the plantae kingdom. All right, and you should hear those words and figure out what I'm talking about. We'll talk more about that later. But notice that within the kingdom, you have a little more specific groups, which we call phylums. And the animal that you see at the top of this classification is an example of a chordata, which is a, a, a phylum of an animal that has a notochord or a central support uh, at the middle of their body. And a spe special type of those chordatas are mammalia, which is an animal that actually uh, is grows inside of the body of, of, the, of the parent and then actually gets cared by this parent by, with a gland, which we call the mammalian glands, with milk uh, as the, after the animal is born. So it's a specific group of animals that actually kind of lets the child be a parasite of them as they grow up. And that's actually an advantage because, you know, it allows the, the father or the mother to take care of the, of the baby without necessarily having to leave them and go hunt. You can actually take them with you because you're, they're inside of you or they're just basically breastfeeding off of you. Yes, a specific group of this is the carnivoras, which are the order or a group of mammalia which actually eats meat. And then you have a specific group of those carnivoras, which are the large felines. You heard about that before. And it's, that's the family we call Felidae. And a specific group within that family is the genus Panthera. We talked also about the genus Felis, which belongs to the same Felidae family. And we then have within that the species. Now, We'll talk later about the, the lecture series, how in modern taxonomy, people came to the realization that these were not enough levels to actually separate all the animals that exist. But you do need to know that each one of these levels of organization equates to a taxon. And the best way to think about this is the same geographical taxons that we use in real life. You know how we have neighborhoods, and then we have towns, and then we have counties and states. And then we have regions, and then we have countries, and then we have, you know, continents, and the earth, and so forth. And so, you see how the animals are organized in a hierarchical method. And remember again, is Dirty King Philip came over for a good shower. And that's going to be a good way for you to remember. You can come up with your own mnemonic, whatever works for you. But remember, domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, and species is the modern way to classify. But scientists sometimes use subtaxa, for example, subphylum, or subclass, or suborder, or subfamily, or subgenus, or even subspecies, when extra levels are actually necessary to uh, actually classify the animals in smaller and smaller groups of organization. And we'll talk about how th there's actually been recently a shift towards using more phylogeny than taxonomy, because taxonomy has its limitations, all right? But anyway, modern taxonomy will have these subcategories and it will also add the domain, which the original Linnaean taxonomy did not include. And we'll talk more about in the end of the lecture series why we added the domain in the top, how, how do we end it. In fact, when I went to school, they, we didn't have these domains and now we actually have them. So this is a new advancement, a very, very late in the 20th century that we actually did. 
So the greatest disadvantage of actually putting animals in this kind of system, and you see here an example of animals that share taxonomy layers with uh, the squirrel. So the squirrel, or the eastern gray squirrel, which is called Squirrus carolenis, is a specific species of squirrel which share its genus with other um, types of squirrels, which shares its family with kind of other kinds of rodents, which shares its order with um, other kinds of uh, non-carnivore mammals, and you also have the class, which is going to be in the phylum and subphylum and kingdom and domain and so forth. And you see here an example that, in a way, squirrels are warm-like because we are all part of the kingdom animal, animalia. So we share the kingdom with, uh, the squirrel shares the ki its kingdom with the worm. So in a way, it's related to the worm, but obviously it's far from the worm because the first taxa that where it's shared is the kingdom. But the squirrel is closer to something like an elephant because it shares the class that the elephant is in. And it's even closer to a rat because it shares the order with the rat. And it's even closer to other um, types of animals like the squirrels because it shares their families with them. And the genus with other squirrels and so forth. So you see that the closer to the center you are to that animal, the more you're actually going to be similar. And you see how, therefore, taxonomy gives a great advantage in actually creating a, a similarity between the animals because each taxa which or in other words each layer provides you information about the characteristics of each animal look for example humans humans belong to the the species homo sapiens and remember we even have a subspecies now which you call homo sapiens sapiens and we belong to the genus homo which basically means any type of uh hominidae which is the family which has a large brain and can use tools but the Homo sapiens has the body proportions of a modern human, and the Homo sapiens sapiens has the intelligence of the modern human. And the hominidae, though, the family we belong to, it has the adaptation to walk. So that has been a while ago in evolutionary sake. And then we have the primates, which are more adapted to climb trees, or we have this, uh, the, this, these hands and all the other things that the primates have. And you also have the class mammalia, which are have hair and mammary glands and you know uh, treat their children like parasites and allow that to happen so they increase the chance of survival of the children we're part of the phylum cordata which has a dorsal supporting rod and a nerve cord and you also have the uh kingdom animalia which is multi uh, multicellular motile ingestive animals uh or eukaryotes and you have the domain eukarya which are the cells that have nuclei so this is a perfect example of and you see that for each taxa, you have to meet a certain criteria to be a member of that taxa. But you see that we share the order primates with other primates, which include things like monkeys and gorillas and things like that. But the first part that we are close to the, to the gorillas is actually at the order level. Because at the family level, we're in hominidae, which is a little further than that. And so you see that depending on which taxonomic level or which taxa you share with the other animal that you're studying, you're going to see how close you are to that animal. So it gives you an advantage about the similarities. Now, the disadvantage of using taxonomy is that it doesn't give you uh, context for these differences and similarities. It doesn't give you uh, insight into the evolutionary process that led to these differences or the history of the development of the animals. In other words, how do we come from eukarya all the way to actually be homo sapiens? How do we develop these actual characteristics which are key of our taxes? Another big problem of using modern tax taxonomy uh, instead of phylogeny is that different levels have uh, a similarity or differences between animals which are at equivalent levels. Let me give an example of that. Uh, going back to this slide here. For example, uh, we share the genus. We don't share the genus with anything else because all the homos are gone, right? But notice that there are different squirrels at the same genus as each other. Okay, and they're very similar. You look at a squirrel, like, oh, that's a squirrel. In fact, you call it a squirrel, and it might be a completely different species of another squirrel, but because they're in the same genus, we call all of them squirrels. Um, but if you then look at a dog, for example, and a wolf, they do share the same genus, but they do seem a little more different from each other, don't they? And think about, for example, things like dolphins and, and, and whales, which share uh, very close taxo taxonomy. They're very close taxonomically. But they're so different from each other. And then you look at things like worms, for example. 
worms of different genuses are so different from each other that an uh, untrained eye would not even be able to tell that they're the same genus. And, and so, in other words, to say that animals are, that share a genus are very, very similar to each other is kind of counterintuitive because it depends. Sometimes animals within the same genus are really, really close, but other times not as close. Sometimes animals within the same class are really close to each other, but other times not as much. And so this means that taxonomy doesn't actually tell you how similar the animals are. It just tells them that there's, they're, they're related to each other, but it doesn't tell you the level of similarity in a consistent way. You look at uh, the families of, of insects, the, the level of similarity is not going to be the same thing as the families of rodents. And so that's kind of like uh, the problem with taxonomy. And we're going to talk about how phylogeny solves some of these problems and creates completely new ones in the next video. I'll see you guys then.